Well, good afternoon. If you are in New York or Cleveland, good evening. If you are in Liverpool, London, St. Petersburg, Kiev, good overnight to people listening all around the world. Hello to everyone in the Southern Hemisphere who listens. It's Friday. This is Fred Plotkin on Fridays. That makes me Fred Plotkin, in which I have guests every week who inspire me with their music making, with their artistry, with their creativity in one form or, or another. My guest today is the wonderful conductor, Vasily Petrenko, whom I've never met, but whose music making I've enjoyed for quite a while. He is joining us from the United Kingdom, but he will be coming to Cleveland soon to conduct the Cleveland Orchestra next week. And Vasily, I, I should say, by the way, you're a conductor laureate of the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic, and you're the music director of the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. While we were waiting for Zoom to log on, I took an envelope and I started writing down names of London orchestras, just the, whatever came to my head. So I had the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, the London Symphony Orchestra, the London Philharmonic Orchestra, the Orchestra of the Age of Enli Envi Enlightenment, sorry, the London Sinfonietta, the Academy of St. Martin's in the Fields, the English Concert, the Philharmonia Orchestra, the Camerata of London Pro Arte Orchestra, BBC Orchestra, Academy of Ancient Music, London Festival Orchestra, plus the orchestras of the Royal Opera House and the English National Opera. And had Zoom not connected, I probably could have written down many more. It makes me start with the question, what is it like to live and work in a city that maybe has more orchestras than any city in the world? I'm not sure about that, but it certainly has many many what is that experience like in terms of artistic ferment but also in terms of getting noticed well good afternoon first of all fred uh, good evening good morning <laughs> good night <laughs> for those who are listening around the world you missed a few orchestras you're absolutely right there's also aurora orchestra which is based here there's also some new uh, very diverse orchestra called chineke orchestra which combines players from uh, ethnic minorities who lives in London. Uh, how to live in London, as always, so hustle and bustle is one of the fastest and one of the busiest cities in the, in the world. It's very unique, uh, not just on the living style, but also on the cultural sphere. There's plenty of happenings uh, every day. There's plenty of happenings every night, every moment, and not just on professional level. All the music schools, all the small galleries, all the small venues they have it and sometimes private individuals they just organize little events you know i was just today i was invited by uh, natasha Tsukano, one of the supporters of the arts in london for let's say uh late evening tea where uh, <laughs> there will be several musicians and the main performance will be max vingero Wow. And it's just a sort of chamber, small party. I know Max for quite a long time, but uh, he will come and probably perform, I don't know, for half an hour and do something. And we'll have a nice conversation. It is very versatile stage. Uh, it is very versatile landscape. Uh, obviously, the challenges, especially post-pandemic challenges, is to find audience and to get all the people to go back to the concert halls, but also to invite the new people. I'm very glad that with Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, we have this new project in Brent, in one of the districts of London, which mainly consists of the people who are not so much yet attached to the classical music. So we're trying to bring them on. We're trying to organize their community as well, because it's a small academy and the children of very young age able to learn with orchestra. They form their own orchestra. And... Uh, a lot of them were on the last concert, which was uh, some small piece by Mahler, Symphony Number no. 8 in Royal Albert Hall. That's and, a little concert. <laughs> and uh, I'm glad to say that that one was complete sold out. It just happened a month ago. Uh, we didn't get a thousand performers, but we had 670 performers, around mm -hmm. 670 on stage, and around 5,000 people in the audience in Royal Albert Hall. So uh, the music landscape in London, of course, it's very intense but there's still a lot of public and a lot of opportunities. What do you have to do? You have to try your best, which is not easy, especially with London way of rehearsals. And uh, unfortunately, the current policies of the government and arts and council who cut the subsidy for the arts in general, 
I do want to get to that, but could you tell me what you mean by London way of rehearsals? Uh, I put it in contract when I signed it with Royal Philharmonic Orchestra that for me, for my concerts, that's at least three, three hours rehearsals plus a dress rehearsal. But this is sort of almost maximum. A lot of orchestras doing it from two rehearsals. Some of the orchestras doing it from one rehearsal. The last time Royal Philharmonic Orchestra did Mahler 8, that was a while ago, uh, uh, but they did it with one rehearsal on the day. (laughs) So, of course, there are certain moments when the orchestra trying their best, but they have to compromise on the quality. Uh, The scheme, how the orchestra is paid in London, which is paid per service, they not allowed to rehearse many days because then you lose you, you lose a lot of money and also it is economically really difficult to hire the venues hire the halls you, know, you say it about all those orchestras but unfortunately london does not have one ideal concert hall that was my next question so um, when i was asking you about their competing for attention the orchestra's competing for attention um, you don't know this because we were only just speaking now, but I've lived in London a lot in my lifetime. I've studied there. I've worked at the Opera House. I've worked at the BBC as a music broadcaster. So I really, London is another hometown for me. And as a New Yorker who is very focused on Lincoln Center and Carnegie Hall for our classical music orchestral performances, although there are many other places, of course, throughout the city, But nonetheless, um, in London, I always have to look up where an orchestra is playing. So, for example, the Royal Philharmonic performs in Cadogan Hall, which is, I guess, Chelsea is the neighborhood to call it. Um, But it also performs on the South Bank. There are venues such as the Barbican. There are the opera houses. There are so many places, not to mention churches, that... um, I, ne- I don't think of London orchestras as having a home, if you know what I mean. Uh, it's true and not true, because uh, obviously London Symphony, a vast majority of performances, it's doing in London in Barbican. Uh, then uh, the residents of South Bank Centre, the London Philharmonic and Philharmonia Orchestra, so they're doing vast majority there. As for Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, uh, the smaller scale concerts for the music which not requires a lot of instruments and a lot of noise level, this is Cadogan Hall. So this is something for Beethoven, Brahms, probably as much as early Tchaikovsky. If you go mm-hmm. there for late romantic repertoire, the hall is a little bit too small for that. But we're also doing a series of concerts, and that's already second year in Royal Albert Hall, outside of the proms. Because strangely enough, Royal Albert Hall never, never had the serious concert series outside of the proms. There's events and gigs, you know, there's Andrea Bocelli passing by or something else, but to have a series, they never had it. So we started last year, last season, with three big British oratorios, Belshazzar's Feast, The Dream of Gerontius, and War Requiem. Mm. War Requiem was in spring, just a few weeks since the war started. It wasn't planned this way, but by coincidence, it was very relevant. This year, it's Mahler 8, Mahler 3, and Mahler 2, big Mahler symphonies. Choral. Next, big choral Mahler symphonies. Yeah. In other okay. hall, that's where you do it. And then uh, for the next year, I can probably already say we're planning uh, the series of performances. First will be reconstruction of what Richard Wagner did in 150 years ago, himself in London, while conducting uh-huh. in Royal Albert Hall. I may not perform all the pieces because otherwise it's four and a half hours concert. But we'll That's reconstruct okay. <laughs> the majority of that. Uh, then there will be interesting project, which is a, a semi-staged, a fully staged version of Iolanta by Tchaikovsky, mm-hmm. preceded by the second act of Nutcracker. It's almost the same way as Tchaikovsky did the premiere in yes. St. Petersburg those days. Yes. Yeah. And then the third large performance there will be 150 years uh, since Verdi Requiem was premiered. Yes. So those are the plans for the next season. And plus we have 
many more for the upcoming years. We are trying to organize a series of concerts in uh, Salbank Center, which this uh, year the title is Journey of Discovery, and it's discovery of different state of mind and different aspects of human society and human mentality. Mm -hmm. uh, delirium, ecstasy, rebirth, everything. Uh, so this is about six concerts, and then another series of concerts in Royal Albert Hall. For us, it's very distinctive. For other orchestras like Philharmonia or London Philharmonic, it's also a very distinctive series, mainly based in South Bank Center and London Symphony, mainly based in Barbican. But all those halls, they're great for certain repertoire. But yeah. there's not such a thing like, for instance, Walt Disney Hall in Los Angeles, which is, you can perform almost everything there and almost everything by acoustics will fit. So I know that I know Britain and the world is having hard economic times now. I know that Simon Rattle attempted to have a new hall created for London. I don't know just for the LSO or for all of London, but um, obviously it's a challenge right now. And so my question really is, how do all of, let's call them the big orchestras, for lack of a better term, attract and keep their audience? And by that, I mean that if the New York Philharmonic performs at David Geffen Hall, people know where to go. But if these big orchestras travel around to the different theaters in London based on repertory and availability, are there subscription series? But if the halls are different, how do you seat people in the halls? It sounds like a, a logistical nightmare. And I know you're music director and not marketing director, but it enters your calculation too in terms of programming as music director. Of course, you have to understand which piece to perform where. Uh, talking about the public, uh, I think uh, it's around the world. It's uh, currently a little bit of the problem to bring the public back after the pandemic years, after the COVID, and also the economic problems. Because in many parts of the world, especially in Europe, uh, the living costs are going up and unfortunately, the salaries are not going up for most of the yeah. people. So it's rather difficult for them to attend the concerts. Uh, we, I think the South Bank Center, uh, it's quite unique in the way that almost every night uh, you can come there and you will definitely, or most definitely, have a great orchestra performing a classical concert. Uh, it has its problems because... Uh, Obviously, it's not just a hall, but the surrounding. It's the center of London. It's next to some theaters, the National Theater and the other theaters. But and, I, the, I, and the Film Society, BAFTA is there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I still think it's a bit lack of infrastructure in terms of restaurants, in terms of venues, in terms of welcoming public. Yeah. And it, it had quite a lot of tourists because walking by the Thames, you just see it and a lot of people coming up. And now I have to say, actually, a lot of ticket sales are in the very last minute. So it's on the day. And it, it's not just in London, it's everywhere. I've just been recently in Berlin and Stuttgart. It's exactly the same. A lot of people buying their tickets just on the day. Mm -hmm. they, they decide on the day they want to come. But with South Bank Center, I think with a clever management, it can be one of the places where you have guaranteed very decent concert, at least five nights out of the week. Will it happen in the future? Who knows? Talking about the concert hall, which Simon was campaigning for, unfortunately, that looks like this idea is buried. Yeah. However, there's a still potential. It's a lot of talks about potential hall in Wimbledon, which is ah. London suburb, yeah. uh, with project from Frank Gehry and mm -hmm. with obligations from the local council to build a hall there. It's still at the first talk, so I wouldn't expect it to be within the next five or six years. But I think London deserves a big, good concert complex for the classical music where everything and everyone will enjoy it. It's interesting how other cities, I'll say Helsinki and Paris to name two, managed to coalesce around building new concert halls. In the case of Paris, it's in the 19th arrondissement, which is kind of like building in Wimbledon. 
that it is not in the city. Well, in I, terms of I, distance from the heart, it's smaller. London is much bigger than Paris. Not not just. I think Wimbledon is still rel relatively wealthy area. Yes, yes. But in you're Paris, right. that was built for the future regeneration of uh, the district around, right. which again had a sort of mixed success yet, but uh, yeah. it's probably a lot of it is effect of COVID again and the pandemic. Uh, however, I can see that, but it's not just those cities. You know, Hamburg, yeah. which Hamburg, entire, entire... even Rome for the for the jubilee in two thousand built the Parco ah, della Musica, yeah. Park of Music, and for the new Accademia Nazionale di Santa Cecilia in Rome, where if you turn over a stone, you discover something two thousand yep. years old. And uh, we recently were with Royal Philharmonic on tour uh, in Bratislava, then in Croatia, and then in Poland, Lithuania, and Greece. So in Poland, we had about six concerts, five of them in completely new halls. Hmm. Krakow, Poznan, Katowice, so all, all quite a small cities, Wroclaw, they all have a new halls built in the last 10 years. So it is possible. It just needs yeah. to be a, a sort of will from from the government there's one hall in poland which was incredible it's a it's a place called bielska biala I, mm -hmm. I don't think you know where it is no <laughs> it's uh about 80 kilometers from krakow towards a german border uh interestingly historically there's uh, two cities which were merged and that's a little bit about our heritage your and my heritage because mm -hmm. the city is on the border of Germany and at that time Russian Empire. So there was a Biel, a German city, yeah. and Biala, which was mainly Jewish city, yeah. who were doing negotiation with, uh, Ger between Germany and Russia at that time. Now it's a small city, it's just around 100,000 citizens there. And a private company called Cavatina built a new concert hall there for about 1,000 seats. It's completely on the private money, not just built, but also run. And they do 120 performances or concerts or gigs within a year. Mm -hmm. And in and it's a good, acoustically good concert hall, relatively small, but for the city, it's perfect. And this is one of the examples how the will, even of the private individual or the small company can change uh, the future. And I think, they're planning the, to do the same near Seattle in Burbank. Yes. So when you come to New York and you and I finally meet, I'm going to take you to eat a bread called a Bialy, which is from there. I don't know if you've had them here before, mm -hmm. but um, it's a bread that originated there. And with immigration to New York, um, we now produce most of the Bialys in the world. Um, about Poland, the secret to their having built all these concert halls is they were built by Polish workers. London is full of Polish workers. I think they it used, get to, the, be. It used to be. Used less so. Correct. You're right. They went home to Poland, but maybe to get the Polish workers to build the concert hall in London, then it will happen. It's a little bit more complicated because a lot yeah. of money uh, was from European Union donated for yeah. those purposes, and after Brexit, I wouldn't expect such There's thing. There's no money for the European in Union. London. Um, I was working in London immediately as the pandemic hit. I flew home on March 8th, 2020. I was at the Royal Opera and have not been back to Europe since then. But when I work in London now for 30 plus years, I take a little flat on Northumberland Avenue, which I have a little kitchen and it's just perfect for me because... I can walk to English National Opera, I can walk to the Royal Opera, so I can walk across the footbridge to Royal Festival Hall in the South Bank Center to the National Theater. So the neighborhood that you were talking about in terms of restaurants and service and so on is a tourist district, but restaurants that would cater to local people. There are a few around the Royal Opera House. There is the wonderful Jay Shiki Fish Restaurant near English National Opera near the Coliseum. But unfortunately, because it's so touristic, it's hard for local people. It's like a New Yorker going to Times Square to look for a good meal. True. It's, yeah. It, it, it's very difficult for local. But, and it is also the fact that a lot of those restaurants are closed. Yeah. They, they did not survive through pandemic. And still, uh, 
there are travel restrictions. A lot of tourists were from China, yeah. and they're not flying yet. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, in the future, that all will be restored. Actually, I think the central area of London will have so, sort of transformation. Difficult to predict which exactly. Not just because of all the hospitality services, but uh, also because of all the offices. We're talking on Zoom, and yeah. a lot of a lot of offices now they're trying to relocate their workers outside from the central London. So those empty buildings they probably will be converted. I don't know, maybe into flats, maybe into something else. But that's only time will show, it and only future yeah. will show. So one thing that. I discovered and we discussed before we went on that you and I share is a heritage that you were born in St. Petersburg. Part of your family is from Ukraine. My grandfather was born in St. Petersburg. My other grandfather was born in Ukraine and my grandmother was born in Ukraine. Uh, so I'm sending love to people in Ukraine and to peace, a wish of peace to everyone. St. Petersburg is a magnificent city musically. It's one of the really great artistic cities of the world. And so you grew up in an environment that is very rich in culture, whether it was the Soviet Union, whether it was Russia, the Russian Federation. So moving to the United Kingdom is not that you suddenly discovered artistic ferment. Saint, would you talk about St. Petersburg as a boy and Leningrad as a boy? And this experience of knowing that Tchaikovsky, Rachmaninoff, Mussorgsky, everybody was there. All the writers were there. It was the Imperial Capital, the art museums, the Hermitages, an astonishing place. The palaces, the, the sense of history in that city that goes back to 1703 when it was built by Italians. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a very unique city, for sure. And when you're saying built by Italians, uh, there was a small Swedish village yeah. <laughs> before. Then Peter conquered those lands. And of course, he wanted to, to have the best city in the world. So he invited the most expensive and most uh, greeted by reputation architects. They were Italians at the time. And they came to him and said, OK, what kind of city do you want? And he said, I want it to look like Amsterdam. Yeah. Because he himself, he spent some years in Amsterdam, uh, mainly study shipmaking. And uh, because of that, he wanted them to build something like Amsterdam. Those guys answered, we've never been in Amsterdam. And he said, mm -hmm. I don't care. So his initial thoughts were to do the, the canals everywhere and the same way as Amsterdam has. However, uh, he faced a lot of challenges, simply because the flooding, you know, the Dutch people, they always uh, dealing with the flood. They have the long history of the dams and everything. Mm -hmm. In St. Petersburg, it's much, much more challenging because with the Western winds, there's so much water goes into the Finnish Gulf. There's still up till now some marks on the buildings when you have the mark of the flood in 18th century, which is about three or four meters above the ground level. Mm -hmm. And the first ever dump was just built in late 90s, 1990s. So he brought all those people and said, and this is why it's unique. It has a very flat landscape. It has this idea as the channels. Later, it was not the channels, but just streets. But it has all Italian proportions, where the height of the building is proportioned with the width of the street. Um, the space between the windows is also proportioned. It is a great city. It is, uh, at the time when I've been there, of course, I, I was lucky. I caught one of the last concerts of Mravinsky as mm -hmm. being a child. I've spent hours and days in Hermitage, first as a child, as a student, then performing there, the special private concerts for some Rothschilds families. Mm -hmm. uh, I also witnessed a lot of rehearsals and concerts of Maris Janssons, Yuri Temirkan of uh, Valery Gerge. In late 80s, when the gate was open, I witnessed the first uh, visit of Lenny Bernstein with New York Philharmonic there. Yeah. Uh, I've seen Sir George Schulte coming to conduct. I've, I've seen many, many conductors, Claudio Abado with his Mahler Orchestra. And uh, it's always been possible and accessible. I have to say what have changed uh, 
quite a lot. It was a feeling of the big village, huge. It's about 5 million inhabitants there, mm -hmm. but everybody knew the city so well. And we're talking about the age when the mobile phones were not exist. Mm -hmm. So if you ask someone on the street, how can I get to such and such address? They'll explain to you and quite likely they'll carry you there. That happened and to me. Yeah. And uh, people were really, really nice and supportive to each other. Almost like you felt like you know each one and everyone. This one slightly diminished, I'd say, because yeah. uh, it became a touristy city with a lot, huge amount of tourists. It became more convenient to live, cleaner, obviously. It, the museums and everything else was in much better quality now. Uh, but it lost a bit of human relation, if I may say. Uh, you still find a lot of great people there, but it's more like business oriented or Europe oriented. Yeah. But it's still, I'm very, very, very grateful for all the heritage which I, I got there. It's a shame that I cannot come right now because yeah. of uh, various reasons. Uh, but I hope that once this war is over, uh, once the peace achieved, uh, I'll be able to go to both countries, to Ukraine and to Russia to perform there, because I think it's my duty. Music and the culture is one of the most powerful tools, how to connect people, how to bridge those gaps which are created now, especially between brotherhood nations. Mm -hmm. I'm, I think there's one part which is unfortunately at the moment due to the heat of the conflict uh, forgotten, is that whatever will happen, we will still need to live as neighbors. Yeah, I We agree. won't go to other planets. We will live as neighbors, and life as neighbors is productive and possible only with mutual respect, only with acknowledgement of values of each other, and only uh, with love, not with angst. This yeah. is something which will be very, very, very hard to achieve on both sides. But uh, I hope that culture will be one of the tools which will serve in this purpose. I didn't plan to talk politics with you. British politics, maybe, but not this politics. Oh, no, please. British <laughs> politics, nobody can follow them. There's too, too but, many changes too quick. <laughs> I did want to ask you one question, given your unique and my unique comparable situation. So many people who live in Russia have Ukrainian relatives. So many people who live in Ukraine have Russian relatives. Is this going to be the way to find peace again? The fact that we are all interrelated so much? I, to be honest, I can't answer this question right now. Uh, okay. uh, at the moment, uh, my dad, he's 85, he lives in St. Petersburg. And uh, on my mom uh, branch, uh, there's about 13 or 15 relatives who lives in Kiev. Mm. And I'm talking to both sides. There's no hate in the country, uh, no hate in the family. Obviously, many, many people, they feel like the government started something completely unnecessary in their favor rather than in favor of, the, of their citizens. Have you and, performed? Yeah. And this is, this is what gives a hope for the future, those relations, because... It's counterproductive to live yeah. and hate each other and just to think how we can make revenge. Revenge does yeah. not lead to the future, really. No. Have you performed Tchaikovsky's Second Symphony? Of course. So that's kind of an explanation of the Russian-Ukrainian link, in a way. There's plenty, plenty more. You know, for instance, the anthem of St. Petersburg which is uh, the, the hymn for the city from the ballet called uh, Bronze Horseman mm -hmm. on, the, on the famous story by Pushkin. It's written by Reinhold Lier, who, yeah. who, who was born and grew up in Ukraine. Uh, the story of Prokofiev, who, for instance, spent a lot of time in the year as, as a child. And opposite, if, we, if you talk about Mussorgsky, about Sorochinsky Fair, that's so much about Ukraine, mm -hmm. and vice versa. They're, 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 they're inter, interlinked cultures, interlinked, uh, inter, interlinked population. You know, we, we all related to each other, this or that mm -hmm. way. What's happening now, it's a huge tragedy. But as I say, I hope that once it stopped, 
uh, the culture will serve its purpose and the culture will bring the peace not just uh, in in the country but in minds you know this this damage of the minds the damage of the souls it's we still yet have to estimate and not just for people here or there it's for people like you and me our yeah. souls are damaged and touched too when you mentioned claudio Bado, when in 1979 i i worked at la scala i worked for Giorgio australia but i had the great privilege of being around Abato a lot and learning from him. And my first visit to what was then called Leningrad in the Soviet Union happened on our summer break at La Scala when I went in August of 1979 to Leningrad. And it was fascinating because the city really didn't have tourists. It had Soviet citizens and people from the Eastern Bloc but no one coming from Italy, not an American with a Russian surname. And so I was something of a curiosity there, but I walked all over the city and people were incredibly warm. What you described about the sense of, you know, family and, you know, they didn't know who I was, but if I asked for something, they would take me. And in whatever common language we had, which was often German, sometimes French, um, not often Italian or English, we would communicate and they would tell me about a building and about World War II and so on. And I really was taken into the, the hearts of many people there. And that created my feeling for the city, um, which I've been back to numerous times now. Just one more question about St. Petersburg. The famous theater is known as the Mariinsky. It has been called the Kirov. There was, I think it was called the Bolshoi, it was a different theater. Or is that the same theater where older works premiered, like Verdi's La Forza del Destino was at the Bolshoi, I think. And I don't uh, know if that's the same theater. Uh, no, Bolshoi is in Moscow. That's historically was right. known. As, I know, as but theater. the theater in my Verdi books, it says that La Forza del Destino premiered at the Bolshoi in St. Petersburg. Uh, because uh, I think there's also historically was Mali Opera Theatre, yes. which yeah. the small opera theatre, which is now uh, Mususki Company, a Mikhailovsky Theatre. Right. Uh, and I think that might give a distinction because at that time there were only two the opera theaters or opera companies in St. Petersburg and the places where you could perform. Now, of course, Mariinsky itself has so many stages. You cannot yeah. even follow how many stages and Mariinsky they're doing so too, many. Yeah. Yeah, they, I think there's about six of them right now already, mm -hmm. and one of them it's still part of Mariinsky, but that's in Vladivostok, which is about yeah. nine hours flight. <laughs> and there's another one in South. Uh, so you know the theater there expanded. Of course, yeah. there's a lot of historical happenings where we're there, as mm -hmm. well as in Conservatoire and as well in Philharmonic. I, I was uh, conducting a few weeks ago, just three weeks ago, Manfred Symphony by Tchaikovsky. That was in Oslo and then in Liverpool. And I read uh, the story about it, about the program, which I I kind of discovered. I knew that Balakirev, another Russian composer, he suggested for Tchaikovsky the program. He had written to him almost a plan for movements and what to do. What I didn't know, though, that about 15 years before Tchaikovsky had written Manfred, Balakirev already had this plan, and he offered it to Berlioz, who was wow. at that point head of uh, St. Petersburg Philharmonic Society, and he was conducting in St. Petersburg himself his music. Berlioz was already old, and he didn't even answer to Balakirev whatsoever. Wow. But that was right after Harold in Italy, and that was mm -hmm. for, for Balakirev a very, very logical decision, another Byron piece. So then he consulted with Stas of the famous critic of the time and then suggested that to Tchaikovsky. And Tchaikovsky at first answered to Balakirev that, no way, I don't know what this piece is about. I don't feel it. Uh, and Balakirev said to him and insisted that, please read this Byron book. You'll find that it fits you as a glove. Mm -hmm. And that's what Tchaikovsky did. And it is, in a way, because of this Byron bisexuality, because of uh, Tchaikovsky's own guilt, because of Tchaikovsky's rejection by some parts of the society, 
and because of his also his journey in the search of immortality and forgiveness. But all that was happening in St. Petersburg, in the places yeah. where which I've been, which I visited many, many times. There's other cities, obviously, where a lot of stories and a lot of history was happening. Nonetheless, here in London, you know, there's you're still walking through the city, and sometimes you see the plaque which dedicated to great British composer Handel. Yeah. Or or you see the on uh, is it Brook Street, 34 Brook Street? Do I remember? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's very close to the place where I live in West yeah. Hampstead. Uh, where it's the house of Sir Edward Elgar, and you can yeah. pass by and you can see the museum. There's a plenty of uh, plaques about uh, Joseph Haydn and his symphonies and many, many, many others. So you know, this history and the history of art is very, very important. And, you know, coming back to importance of art and importance of culture, culture is what would actually bound the humanity together. That's what in many ways differs us from animals. This is our heritage. This is how we are trying to give our principles, moral principles, and our living principles to the next generations. And that was for centuries, millenniums of years. It started from the moment when someone started to sing a song about the hunting on the mammoth many, many, many years ago in Neanderthal's time, probably. Mm -hmm. And this is something what we have to continue to do because without culture, what, what are the purposes? That's very famous by uh, Winston Churchill, who was given the budget, the military budget at the start of the World War II and where the culture was completely cut. And that's when he said that why do you cut the culture? Say, well, we need everything for, for the victory. He said, no, without culture, our victory is worthless. And it for that, recently, yeah, for it that, was that was an article in the New York Times about Churchill as a painter, because about 40 of his paintings were put on sale recently, and about his views about art. He didn't think of himself as a great painter, but he understood art, which made him a remarkable leader, unlike many other leaders. But this is something what we have to remember and what we have to pass for the future. There's a there's eternal values. You know, I recently was talking about Beethoven, and during Beethoven time, there were how many? Seven or eight wars at the territory. And from those wars, we barely remember anything. We do remember the figure of Napoleon. We probably will remember one or two chancellors of Germany and local people. But Everyone remembers Beethoven. Yeah. When I teach opera, I always tell people that Wagner and Verdi, both born in 1813, were born in the middle of a world war. People forget that Wagner's father died on the battlefield mm -hmm. when Wagner was a baby. And Verdi lived out in the country, but he knew war because he lived in a country that was not a nation. It was, it was occupied by foreign nations. I'm going to neatly transition to another topic that I love. We're leaving St. Petersburg in one form, but coming to it in another. You made your Metropolitan Opera debut, and I went to every performance of one of my very favorite operas, Tchaikovsky's Queen of Spades, Peak Dom, um, in November of 2019, basically three years ago now. You probably had your final dress three years ago today. And it was the Met debut of the wonderful Norwegian soprano Lisa Davidson. Yerman was Yusuf, I, I don't never pronounce his name right, Ivazov, uh, the old Countess Larissa Dyatkova, Prince Yuletsky, Igor Golovatenko, Count Tomsky, Alexei Markov. Wonderful cast. The production was by a friend of mine, Elijah Moshinsky, who sadly died of COVID. He was one of the, he died in London. He was one of the first yep. people I knew to die of COVID. I think it's a magnificent production. And I remember when he came to do it originally. It's to me, one of the great opera productions I know anywhere. One night there was a technical problem with the final scene where Lisa, the character, goes into the river. But um, would you talk about number one? bringing an opera to the Met with its wonderful orchestra and scenic resources that's set in the city where you grew up based on 
great Russian literature, with great Russian music. What you brought to the storytelling beyond simply the notes on the page? Well, first of all, you're absolutely right. There was fantastic cast of the singers. Uh, there was, it's a, it's a great production. Sad that Elijah passed away. Uh, it is, of course, something very special. Uh, it's something on the senses. You know, you sense uh, the city. And because I was walking and I was in those places for so many times, I've seen and even participated as a boy in the production very, very early. Uh, and uh, also I read, obviously, the story and I've done so much of Tchaikovsky and the other things. You're bringing some special deep understanding and deep uh, knowledge of that. But I have to say that not just Russian cast, but the same Lisa, uh, Lisa Davidson, even at the very first rehearsal, when we just met, uh, she already started to ask me questions about backgrounds of this or that word, of this or that area in such details. It is a joy to work with the soloist and with all the cast and the orchestra too. They were asking a lot of questions uh, regarding the background of the story. It's a joy to work with people who are trying to get to the core of the piece. And that's what we all were trying to do. And uh, in many ways, we uh, succeeded. Uh, we had, with Yusuf Evazov, uh, he was Herman there, we had uh, countless hours of talks, not even singing the notes, but just discussing uh, what are the motivations of Herman. Because it's not so easy. Why Herman, first of all, who is again, he's German. Mm -hmm. He's something very, very different. He's a different breed who lives in Russia, who does not have respect because he's German, because everybody else is just wasting their money and he's not. And they look, they look at him, they think he's a strange, he's a strange man. And then does he really love Lisa? When is this moment when he loves her? Why did he leave her? Is he mad or is it not? Or, or does he try to protect her from his madness? So there's so many aspects, there's so many edges and many corners in this piece which we were working through and walking through. And it's been a very successful uh, debut. <laughs> and it's been a great yeah. uh, run of performances. We had uh, upcoming plans which uh, were unfortunately shut by COVID. Yeah. So. I'm now looking forward, and we, we have discussions already with the artistic department of the Metropolitan Opera, uh, when and how to come back. Because you have to eat the Bialis here, apart from anything else. Um, oh, yeah. Because you are from St. Petersburg, and because Catherine the Great, who also was a German, was from St. Petersburg, she appears in the opera. She does not have a singing role. But the way Elijah produced this, it's one of the great moments in an opera production I know anywhere. And with the chorus and the old countess bowing down mm -hmm. and everyone bowing down. The, when the production was new, and I think it was 1994, and we had Ben Hepner and Maria Guligina and later Corita Matila, mm -hmm. amazing cast. Um, we had a woman who worked at the Met. I worked at the Met for many years. And the Met, like all of these different theaters, is a family. And there was a woman there named Inga Rappaport. And Inga worked in the gift shop. Before that, she owned a beautiful toy store on East Se on 3rd Avenue and 79th Street. When I was a little boy, my toys came from Rappaport's gift shop. I remember the wrapping paper. Inga had a very buzzy voice like this, and you would never be a singer. And But she was a lot of personality, is all I can say. And when Inga walked through the hallways of the Met, as a volunteer, whatever she did, you always heard Inga. And she came into my office one day and said, Fred, I have news for you. I've been playing Catherine the Great in, in Queen of Spades coming to the Met. And Inga, they built that scene around Inga. And they put her in white wigs and everything. And she channeled her personality in such a way that the audience gasped. They didn't know it was Inga. I did. But when that appearance happens, it, would you talk about it? You saw this in the pit, not with Inga. She's gone, unfortunately. But Sheila Ricci, I think, played it when you did it. Yeah. Just talk about 
that scene conducting it, but also seeing it because the what Moshinsky did and Mark Thompson, the designer, this is when opera achieves a kind of nirvana that only happens when everything comes together. It's sort of very special appearance. And you're right, this, this is a role which does not pronounce even a sound. Yeah. And uh, this is a role, though, which gives, hmm, it's sort of mixed. You wouldn't say it's just oppression. It, it's something what I think Elijah got quite right from the Russian culture of the, of the time. It's mixed mixture of fear with a bit of hope, but uh, also with truly acknowledgement that such a decisions has to be made. It's something with its eternal hope for the Tsar and responsibility of the Tsar uh, or as the only person to make decisions. That's why probably democracy, which was at certain extent tried to be implemented in post-Soviet Russia, led now to a situation when it's back again to the decisions yeah. of only one Tsar. Yeah. And uh, this moment, you, you really sense it, you really feel it. You know, we obviously rehearsed it without any weeks, without uh, yeah. addresses or anything else. And but even by then, it's a posture, it's a manner of walking, it's it's a pace of um, of the poses, it's a pace of uh, hand moves. Yeah, it's it, it's a pace of the even like eye eye movements and in the pace of the sides. So it is a very special moment. One of those when you have a personage in the operas where you see this personage only once, but it still leaves you such an impression. Yeah. And the genius of Tchaikovsky, who had a lot of genius, was in the next act, the old countess has come home from this big event, where the old countess, though important in the city for many reasons, is not Catherine the Great. And she comes home exhausted because she's very old and frail. And the wonderful choral music of, of the servant women around who try to gently deal with the old countess, who all of her energy has been expended and the way they remove the wig and the dress and she goes from looking rather attractive to looking like a very sick old woman who finally sits in a chair. We won't explain what happens in the chair, but um, it Tchaikovsky's music goes from this grandeur of Catherine the Great to the story of the old countess, who is, there's no title character, but in a way she's the title character. Well, there's a real historical prototype of her, yeah. of the yeah. countess who had this affair with a French high, high profile aristocrat. And then what happened with her, but she was still in control and the power of the many aristocrats and especially young aristocrats at the time, they were almost obliged to go through her hands and through her approval mm -hmm. to be accepted by the by the court by the society and uh, she lives really very very long time the historical prototype yeah. and of course Tchaikovsky knew all that and there's also rumors in that in some ways he was trying to portray von Neck mm -hmm. through the through the countess His patron yeah uh, but uh, I, I didn't really believe that because von Meck was a very different person. Yeah. So I think for him, it, it was more of this symbol. And again, raising more questions. Does she deserve her faith? Mm -hmm. Is agree. it good what she's doing with her relatives or with the whole society? There's, you know, there's edges. As, as every great story, as every great piece of music, it asks you the questions which you probably afraid to ask yourself you and i are i that's how i live <laughs> with with that philosophy before we leave queen of spades because i i love it's one of my favorite operas and i don't get to talk to people about it very often the character of lisa is the granddaughter of the old countess her ending i think we can talk about it she drowns herself in the river um 
to some of the most amazing music ever written. And because she's not singing at a certain point and it's just the music, this to me rivals almost what Wagner did in the ring cycle in terms of being consumed by water. It's, and, uh, I don't think it's, yeah. it's the ring cycle. I think it's Flying Dutchman. And the influence yes. of Flying Dutchman was quite big. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's where Tchaikovsky probably took inspiration. As, uh, uh, but it also this water or sea theme and the storm theme was very present in many operas. Now, if you look into Sadko, then later on, if you look into Kitish, there, there, there was always the, those stories. So I think for Tchaikovsky uh, to make this storm and to create this visual aspect of her droning herself into actually very, very small river. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the she's Neva. Not she's not throwing herself into Neva River, which is a big one. <laughs> but but th this is actually the very, very small. But, you know, in the winter time, obviously, with all the clothes on her, she would, she would be drawn, most likely. So it is one of those ingenious moments, but Tchaikovsky always was able to picturize uh, the soul and also emotions of his heroines. You know, the famous scene of Tatiana's letter, for instance. The also majority of it is just orchestra. Yeah, true. So since we're talking about water, um, I hadn't planned to go in this direction, but I'm going to. You recently conducted a work in Berlin that I don't know at all by Zemlinsky. I know of Zemlinsky somewhat, um, but the Zee Jungfrau, which means the little mermaid. And I know it's based on the story of Hans Christian Andersen, but I think I also know that it's really autobiographical about Zemlinsky. Would you talk about Zemlinsky, this music and the backstory that he incorporated into it that's not the little mermaid? Well, first of all, I would love to bring this piece to America and would love to perform it in the United States. So hopefully in New York for you, or maybe in some other cities. It is a great music. Zemlinski is a great composer. He was also a great conductor. Interestingly, when he was writing this piece, uh, he was conducting almost every night the operetta by Lehar, because he was conductor of Claudio Theater in Wien. And every single night he was doing first and then the Meravido or the, some other things. And only by the second year, he managed to uh, develop a successor or his assistant who will be good enough to conduct uh, Tuesdays. And that allowed <laughs> Minsky to finish the, the piece. Uh, this guy with Polish descent, he was later a famous conductor and actually conducted in the Met quite a lot. Mm -hmm. so, but for Zemlinski himself, that was a very very personal story because of what happened between him, Alma Schindler, and Gustav Mahler. Alma Schindler was one of the students of Zemlinski, and they fell in love, and they even had a wedding date. But then Gustav appeared on station within one month. She preferred Gustav and married him. And Zemlinski, with all this drama, he, though, recognized the genius of Gustav Mahler as a composer, and he was still his friend until the end of the life. He was mm. the one who conducted first posthumous performance of Das Lied von der Erde in Vienna, just the days after mother died and his uh, funerals. Uh, and Zemlinski himself, in this famous story by Hans Christian Andersen, associated himself with the mermaid, who sacrificed her love for the sake of life of the prince. And in case of Tsimlinski, he sacrificed his love for the sake of genius of mother. I think a lot of uh, this wonderful piece is very autobiographical, and a lot of it is something what Tsimlinski was required by himself to put into the music, to ease the pain and to find the peace. And the story of the piece was also not really easy. It was premiered, but then he withdrew it, and he did not allow it to perform because it probably was very painful for him for quite mm -hmm. a few years. And only later, the cut version with a, with a cut, which he made himself in the second movement, was accepted as the piece to be performed. And now in Berlin, this is the first time in Germany, I think, when we did the full version. 
where the second movement is in full, so the, the mermaid is also traveling to the witch for, for all the happenings which happens. And uh, to me, of course, Semlinski is one of the composers which I'm trying to bring as much as I, as I can. It's, it's a great music, not just mermaid, but also a lyrical symphony. His songs are incredible. There's plenty of composers. Yes. We, are, we are so lucky. Over the last three or four hundred years, we have such a heritage of music. We would probably never be able to perform all the music which was written. I can tell you when I was 18 in St. Petersburg and when I was studying symphonic conducting already, I started to make a list in alphabetical order of all the pieces which I would like to conduct in my life. <laughs> I started at the second A4 format page because by then we saw small handwriting. I only got to letter K. Mm -hmm. And I realized that most likely, and I know it for sure now, most likely all my life will be not enough to conduct and perform all the music which I would like to conduct and perform. Well, I'm going to start with a piece that starts with the letter A. Uh, it connects in a way to the Little Mermaid. Namely, um, we know that Dvorak did Ruzalka, which is a similar series of stories. That's not what I want to talk to you about. You in March in Dresden will be conducting a piece by Dvorak. I do not know the Aquarius. What is that? Well, it's another, you know, we're talking about water, water music. music. Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> another, it's typical Dvorak. And, you know, I'm looking forward for that because that will be one of another discoveries for the public and for, for everyone and for myself as well. So for me, uh, it's very important that we, we're not just trying to stick with uh, you know, the blockbusters. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to support the contemporary music, which I still think it's, it's a duty because without the new pieces being written and premiered, there's no future for the music. Yeah. We're also trying to not forget a lot of pieces which really deserves to be performed more often. The, the last uh, discs before pandemic, which I recorded, which contained uh, symphonies of Prokofiev and Miskowski. For many people, Miskowski was complete revelation. It's a great mm -hmm. composer. He had written 27 symphonies. They were friends with, friends with Prokofiev. They were showing each other the sketches of the pieces, the only people they showed the sketches of the pieces by themselves. And uh, it's incredible music, which only little known in Russia, but nowhere else. Now mm. it's a renaissance of uh, Mishislav Weinberg. Yes. Him, which another composer who had written incredible music. And people just know, they don't know that they actually know his music very well. Because Weinberg was for many years a composer for Soviet circus. So mm -hmm. anyone who was... <laughs> Visiting the performances of circus from Soviet Union or Soviet Army circuses, they always were hearing music from Weinberg. But he's a very serious composer and he had written also a number of symphonies. He incredible violin concert, incredible cello concert. And so there's a lot of things. And there's a lot of discoveries on the other hand. Now I'm trying to program symphonies by Charles Ives, by Bohuslav Martinu, which are written in the United States. I'm trying to bring them to the, the other countries. Again, we are so, 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 so lucky with all the heritage we have. Yeah. This program, I mean, I'm, I've been reading through your upcoming year, and it's an extraordinary amount of music. This one that you're doing in Dresden, it's March uh, 3rd and 4th is a full program. Has Dvorak the Aquarius, Elgar Sea Pictures, and Zemlinsky's The Little Mermaid, the, the Ze Jungfrau. And... You have a friend of mine singing, Alice Coote. Alice and I share a birthday. She's a wonderful, very yeah. emotional, beautiful, beautiful I, I, singer. Which piece is she singing? <laughs> is well, she singing? Is... Obviously, um, uh, that, there, there will be a role for her. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You know, I'll, I'll, I'll take it at that. I wish I could get to Dresden, but my friends in Germany, please go to Dresden for this program because Vasily Petrenko, Alice Kut, the Dresden Philharmonic, and this music sounds like something I would mark on my calendar. Um, you are going to Cleveland, I think, in a day or so. 
Yep. And the Cleveland Orchestra, I think I'm fair to say, is one of the great orchestras of the world. And I only recently got to visit Cleveland before the pandemic and discovered Severance Hall, which is a wonderful, wonderful theater. Um, it's a beautiful lobbies, the restaurants, the the design is very beautiful. I think the acoustics are very fine. I heard a Mahler Four Symphony there that was excellent. And talk about what you'll be doing. You're doing Elgar Prokofiev and William Walton. Um, so it's partially a British program. It's partially a British program. It is great to be back to Cleveland. It's one of my favorite orchestras in the world. Uh, not just by technical excellence, but also by their sense of discovery and their flexibility. Uh, so this, we start with uh, Edward Elgar Cocaine Overture, which apparently have nothing to do with a, with a famous drug. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually still have to find out myself, was the drug named after this co cocaine as a kingdom of delirium? Which was which the, the name of cocaine? A, you can find it even in the medieval poetry, and it's a symbol of the place where everything is great, where you can have all the pleasures, where where you can peacefully find the joy, the land of joy, the land of pleasure, and um, sort of utopian, obviously. Mm -hmm. But many of the poets, many of the people were describing it. And that's what Elgar was describing as a land of joy, London, London town. At the and time, for listeners, was, it's spelled C-O-C-K-A-I-G-N-E. It's different spelling, obviously. Yeah. But uh, that was uh, the, the name itself was spelled also differently during the centuries. There was I and Y in the middle. There was double K, single K. Uh, but for Elgar, that was a land of joy, the land of uh, pleasures, a land of youth. It's a journey through the London town of the group of the young individuals, enjoying their lives, enjoying what, everything what London can offer. There's a secret mm -hmm. garden, there's a church, there's a love, there's uh, even Salvation Army marching through at one point. <laughs> this is youthful Elgar and uh, full of energy. It's one of the most brilliant overtures, I think, written at the edge of the 19th century. century. Then, of course, Prokofiev's second concerto, second piano concerto with my good friend and great pianist, uh, Bezot Ab Abdurahimov. And uh, this is uh, also a very special piece for Prokofiev. He first had written it in 1913, 1914. For him, uh, that was sort of the way, as he described in his diaries, uh, how to get away from my soccer player dreams of the first concerto. <laughs> And he was writing it as much, much more serious piece. And his friend during uh, this writing has committed suicide. And that's why it's dedicated to his friend. Then uh, the piece was premiered and then revolution, World War I started and then the revolution happened and Prokofiev left in 1918. And uh, he left the score in St. Petersburg. He didn't took it with him. And the score, the score was burned. And then only in 1923, when he was already considering to go back to, to Russia, to Soviet uh, Russia, he, he said that he reconstructed the piece, but most likely he had rewritten quite a lot of things. Interestingly, in 1927, the piece was performed by the special orchestra called Persim Fans. Do you know about this orchestra? No, no. It's a very special orchestra which was created uh, early 1920s. In, they performed in Petrograd and in Moscow. And uh, their main idea was they perform everything without conductor. Ah. So of course they had a lot of rehearsals. And of course, I think some of the concerts were a complete mess, especially with contemporary music. But their idea was that in such case, we'll have a freedom of expression individually. Mm -hmm. It was interesting experiment. And again, Prokofiev in his diaries, he's writing for, for a long time, how difficult it is to rehearse with orchestra without conductor. <laughs> and he's, he was also having, he was a brilliant pianist, but the, 
the second piano concerto is one of the most difficult and challenging pieces for the technical and also mental aspects of the soloist. It has a huge cadences and it has all the lyric parts. It, all, it has all the melodies which Prokofiev was master of. Interestingly, in 1913, the public thought that, oh no, that's too contemporary, that's too difficult in, in, in St. Petersburg. In 1923 and 1924, in the Reprim year in Paris, the public thought that, oh, it's too easy. Mm. Because after Stravinsky, after everything was happened in Paris, they felt that it's not contemporary enough, in a way. But uh, I think the time shown and proved that this is a real masterpiece. And I'm so much looking forward to performance with Big Zot. And then, yes. And then, of course, you know, Walton First Symphony, which is, uh, for many people, is impersonation of the time, but it's very personal story of uh, William Walton. He also was in his early 30s. He had written Belshazzar's Feast, the Viola Concerto. Mm -hmm. he, he was famous. And he fell in love with German Baroness Irma von Dürrenberg. She was German-Swiss. Mm -hmm. And uh, somehow this love story did not go really well. It never uh, does. <laughs> but, well, partly by their, actually, the relevance of the pieces, partly by their different political views in 1933 on what was happening in Germany and in England at that time. So she was quite something, I think. Mm -hmm. And the first uh, movement of the, of the piece is one of the most energetic movements of all the symphonies. It's almost if Beethoven Fife would meet some Sibelius principles. <laughs> it has this burst of energy and almost uh, integrity of the modern world with a lot of drama, with a lot of desire, with a lot of things. The second movement, it's, it calls Presto con Malizia. So it's her malicious way to offend him. And it's almost like domicile violence in this <laughs> goes on. Then it goes to Andante con Malincolia. Then he has this mm -hmm. melancholy probably of considering that this love story is over. And first he premiered just three movements uh, in 1934, 35, and he couldn't go further. It was almost like creative block for the how to write the finale. And then he met uh, a Vicontess who was 22 years older than him, with whom they lived actually quite happily after. And then it's almost like new life, new story, new optimism. And the last movement is leading into the new world, into mm -hmm. something that is very optimistic and very triumphant. Probably at the end, even more triumphant than you would expect. It also has influence of Sibelius with ending with a distant course, like in Fifth Sibelius Symphony. But it's very unique uh, language. And of course, uh, it's a very unique symphony in the, in the middle of the 20th century. I'm going to go back to Prokofiev just because I want to share something with listeners that I know you know. Um, that when I teach Prokofiev, I talk about his early biography and the fact that most Russian Soviet composers and musicians who traveled out of the country went west. They went to Paris, they went to New York, and so forth. Prokofiev went east. He traveled all across the vast expanse of the Russian Empire. I don't know if he left from Vladivostok or where, but he wound up in San Francisco. And he performed in San Francisco for a while, and then went to Chicago, where he wrote The Love for Three Oranges that had its premiere in Chicago. And then he came to New York. And then he went to Europe and spent a lot of time in Paris. And then he wound up back in his homeland. And at a time when Stalin was coming in and so forth. And therefore, his trip was the opposite of every other Russian artist I know of. And uh, he died the same day as Stalin. Outlived which, by 30 minutes. Yes, which is similar to another story. Listeners know I'm teaching a course now about Verdi on Adagio. Verdi and Queen Victoria died on the same day. Well, yeah, but they didn't have <laughs> so much interaction. As well, a little, and I'm going to get to that. But but the thing was that in the newspapers in the United Kingdom on that day, it was all Queen Victoria. Close. In the newspapers in Milan, it was all Giuseppe Verdi. 
in the newspapers in the Soviet Union, it was all Stalin and really not much Prokofiev at all. There was a famous uh, letter or memoirs from Shostakovich, who was cheating at the flower shop, just mm. buying the flowers, saying that he's going to Stalin's funeral. And in fact, mm. he was going to Prokofiev funerals. And it was attended by only a handful of people, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, but no, to me, in all this journey of Prokofiev, and his incredible and remarkable life, you know, even in in the law, there's a famous casus of Prokofiev, which is, exists. But uh, for me, always was a question, why did he return back to Soviet Union? Uh, his mother was going through all those things in Baku with uh, red commissars. He knew about communists, everything. You know, he had no illusions. He had this invitation from Lunacharsky and he had this bit of interaction. And in his diaries, when he arrives into uh, St. Petersburg and then Moscow, it's, it's kind of bitter that apparently those disillusions which he had, they are, they are right. But he then stayed and left. I only find an answer that he, from the very young age, he wanted to be number one. He wanted to be champion. He was one of those breeds. Mm -hmm. So, when he traveled west and escaped the revolution, he was a great pianist, in the, one of the really, really top class, and a great composer. However, in the United States, he found that there's some guy called Rachmaninoff, who is number one, at least according to American publicity. And then, as a composer, he found there's, mm, there's another guy called Stravinsky, who was at the time, for sure, the number one composer. Of, of Russian Especially origins. Especially in Paris, yeah. And he couldn't sort of tolerate it for himself. So then he moved to back to Soviet Union, almost like trading his freedom for the possibility to be the number one composer and probably number one piece. He didn't know enough about Neuhaus, about Nikolai, about all the massive amount of the new young pianists in Soviet Union who would overtake him very, very quickly. And as a composer, he probably underestimated Shostakovich. Well, that was my next question. Um, I don't know much about the relationship, if they had a relationship between Prokofiev very and Shostakovich. Little. Very yeah. little. There's a famous story. They were forced uh, in 1943. They were forced, to, it's the only time when they were forced to stay in the same village. There was evacuation mm -hmm. village from the Composers Union of Soviet uh, state and it's a small village Prokofiev uh, had a room in the house Shostakovich was living in the ham house where the hands were eaten a long time ago but they were sitting there and at the time Prokofiev was writing fifth symphony Shostakovich was writing his eighth symphony and they were sitting there and this is I hope this is true written by both of them uh, they were sitting there and Prokofiev was describing to Shostakovich, I'm Dmitri, I'm thinking about a new symphony and I think the first movement will be dedicated to the heroic effort of Soviet folks, not on the front line, but somewhere back, who working day and night and they're trying very hard suffering to bring the victory and it's a huge heroic movement. The second movement will be sort of portrait of the bureaucrats to poisoning our lives, typing machines, and all this bitiness, maybe even with their Friday nights out and the things which we've seen in common life. Then for the third moment, I'm thinking of recycling my music from the Queen of Spades, which mm. first I thought to do the ballet, then it transformed into the movie, and I decided not to complete the ballet because there's some opera by Tchaikovsky. And that will be a slow scene, almost like the Herman sitting and waiting at the time on the night and white night, graphing all these passions. And then the finale, I think it's, it should be in the form of Rondo, very optimistic, going into the future, into the future society, maybe with a touch of madness from all this work and the things. And I think it's all B-flat major will be great. So, Dmitri, what do you think about all that? And Dmitri looked at him and said, mm, such a nice weather today. <laughs> so they, they were not a close friends. But 
at least they were not <laughs> enemies. I think for Shostakovich, the crucial point was when uh, Prokofiev allowed for his first wife, the Spanish soprano, whom he met, and who he met in New York, but then they married in Spain, he allowed for her to be repressed. He already was in love with another very accomplished daughter of one of the party bonuses. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a casus of Prokofiev, well known in jurisprudence, because uh, they in Soviet Union, they told him that Soviet Union at that time, they did not, uh, they did not ratify it the marriages made in the other countries. And because yeah. he married in Spain with her, he's, they say to him, you are free. So he married another woman without divorcing the first mm -hmm. wife. She was repressed. She spent eight or nine years until the Stalin death uh, in Siberia, in all these camps, prisoner camps. And uh, he had died, Prokofiev had died the same day as Stalin. And then he left two legitimate widows. Mm -hmm. And that's famously known as Casus, Casus of Prokofiev in the yeah. law. She actually, his first wife, uh, she was quite something because then she went back to Moscow quite quickly, reinstated herself into the society and then moved to London. And then she took all this course and she put all her efforts into uh, his heritage, into trying to bring his music into the stages. She made a deal with Boozy and Hoax and the other uh, publishers. Even after such betrayal he did to her so but Shostakovich I think he did not forgiven for Prokofiev yeah that I think and that's why they never were really close friends and I think they were they also were very different by the by the characters one very yeah. introverted another very extroverted I want to ask you about a Russian opera that you're going to be working on in Munich at the Munich Opera Festival upcoming. I have one specific question, but you'll I know you will tell me all kinds of other things that I don't know to ask. Um, it's Boris Godunov, which is for many people the greatest Russian opera. I never say the greatest anything, but it's a magnificent work. It will be done at the National Theater in Munich in July of 2023 as part of the Great Opera Festival in Munich. Which version and why? Because I'll just say as a preface that the so-called Polish Act, the Marina Act, is a more recent addition that for many years was preferred. But lately, all the Borises I've seen have been no Polish Act. I saw it in London with Bryn Turville. I saw it in New York with Rene Papa. And I've not seen a Marina Act in quite a while. Which version are you doing? Well, this is exist production, obviously, so that will be a revival. And because of that, this is without Polish acts. Uh, there's another difference, which is uh, also is five or seven scenes, because uh, this one ends with the death of Boris. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's another version which might be even more relevant nowadays. Uh, it's with with the uprise. Yeah, at the at the very end, where you uh, the holy man, he he sits there and he's kind of predict the fate of Russia at the time. I personally, with probably my pedigree and my background, I prefer that version. That it's not the death of the guilty Tsar, uh, who's buried by his sins, which ends the opera, but it is the folks, it is the people. It is technically in history after all that happens, there was another 80 or at least 90 years of constant violence in the country. And the prediction of it, uh, I think to me at least, it gives even more powerful message rather than just death of the Tsar. But this version will end with him dying. Okay. Here is something that if I ran an opera company that I would do very soon, and now I know I would hire you to do it. Um, I've always wanted to see in repertory Boris Godunov in a version to be determined and Verdi Simone Bocanegra, perhaps with the same bass, perhaps with two basses alternating yep. in the roles. 
either playing fiasco or who knows, Simone, it depends on the voice category. But I think there's so much resonance between those two operas, their stories, the characters, musically. I think a lot can be found, the choruses, the uprisings, all of that. And I've never seen them paired. And I always felt that this, to me, in terms of repertory, for example, the Metropolitan Opera this year did Medea and Adomineo at the beginning of the season, both wonderful. And I found a lot of resonance between the two in terms of the stories of the Greek stories and a lot of Corinth. And sometimes in operas like Rose and Cavalier, Le Nozze di Figaro is an obvious one, you find connections. And I like presenting them together. Um, it's a great idea. I'm not sure how it will work on the same night, though. But well, not on the same night. I mean, in repertory. So, for example, on Monday you do one opera, on Tuesday another, break on Wednesday, and then back again. And I, I would love to do that. You know, I, I, I honestly find a lot of relations between various operas. There's, there might be also quite interesting to add Macbeth to that. Sure, yeah. To give another edge on the story. I agree with you, but I would. I love Verdi, obviously, but I wouldn't want two Verdi's, one with No, I, I know. Want, I know. I would want a third composer if we were to do that. And the other, the other thing which I'm also dreaming for a long time to do, to do something like Parsifal and Yolanta. Yes. Because those are spiritual journeys which are yeah. quite in a similar way. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's plenty of connection in psych, psychic and psychological operas here and there. And I have another repertory proposal for you for the London, for the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra when you are at Albert Hall. Um, I mentioned to you before that Verdi and Queen Victoria had a connection. Yep. And the connection was that she loved opera a lot. Unlike more recent royals, she really loved opera. And she had a box at the Royal Opera House um, in which, and also at Her Majesty's Theatre, I believe on Haymarket, um, in which she did not see the stage. She sat and looked at the audience and had a mirror in the box that reflected what was happening on the stage so she would know. And she often went three times a week. And the first Verdi opera performed outside of Italy, that premiered actually outside of Italy, was in London. The mm -hmm. first Verdi opera performed was uh, Il Lombardo della Prima Crociata, not Nabucco, but his fourth opera. Mm -hmm. But the first one commissioned outside of Italy was not the Paris operas, but the one he did for London, I Masnadieri, mm -hmm. based on a Schiller. And musically, it's great. There's great music for soprano. It's not the longest Verdi opera. And it's this kind of thing I think you can build an event around Verdi in London. Well, and... it would be, would be great to do, actually, quite a lot of events about Verdi. Because, you know, unfortunately, I have to say that most people just coming for Rigoletta, Traviata, and uh, what else? Occasionally, some other titles. But Aida. Aida, yes. Yeah. And and Covent Garden has done Falstaff and Otello on occasion. Yeah, <clears> but <throat> it's it's still not so known. I've done Falstaff with Brim for myself, this semi-state yeah. uh, version. And Otello, of course, more known, but there's many, many more, you know, from Louisa Miller. To... Traviata also. But, the, I mean, I immerse in Verdi, so I'm, I'm very much about him and he about me, if I can make that assumption that he's my hero. I'm not saying he's my favorite composer, but as a man, he is my hero. And therefore I love teaching about him and studying about him. And his works are not understood outside of Italy because they're about interpersonal relationships mm -hmm. in ways that Puccini does not have. Puccini has a woman who has problems and it has everyone around her. Uh, Donizetti often has that Rossini, to some degree, will have a leading character or two. Yeah. I love them all. Bellini has that. But Mozart has interpersonal. Wagner, in a very different, much longer yeah. way, has interpersonal. But no one did it better than Verdi. Understanding values, 
based on mostly the values of Italy, not in every opera, but the values of Italy, so that Italians connect to what he had to say because he was mirroring their lives. Even if what we see on the stage was not their life, but something uh, like Rigoletto was the lives yeah, of Italians. Yeah. I, I also think that uh, this sense of drama and instincts uh, in building the history for Verdi, you know, his instincts are probably nobody else in operatic world, in operatic composer's world, have the same sense and the same ability to create such a dramas. Yeah. Vasily Petrenko, I think you and I could speak for hours. I'll bring the Bialis. <laughs> it will be a pleasure. However, I need to get my daughter to bed, probably. Okay, you do that. It's already evening. Okay. I thank you so much. And audiences, wherever you are in London, in Cleveland, in Dresden, in a lot of Spain, I know you have coming up. If Vasily Petrenko is on the program, get a ticket. It'll be an inspiring performance. The, the what he, as you can see, what he brings to the music, above and beyond his very assured musicianship, is the knowledge and awareness of what's behind these pieces, and that's why I so connected when I heard you perform Queen of Spades in New York. I really felt I was watching and listening to someone who not only got the notes and the setting, but the soul of what was happening. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Fred. And it's a great pleasure to talk to you. Uh, you're absolutely right. You know, for me, notes are the symbols created by Italian monk. But it's <laughs> what is more important. Guido D'Arezzo is... in 954. <laughs> yeah, the main purpose for him was not to wake up at 6 a.m. on Sunday morning. <laughs> and But it's what is more important is what is behind the notes. What is the story? Because the storytelling and what we bring as a message and how we can make the life of people better, this is our mission, not the playing notes. Great you to do talk it beautifully. to you. Great to Likewise, see you. I will hope see you to again. See you, hope to see you in States or on this side of the pond. I would love that. Keep up the Thank good you. work. Thank Thanks, you. Fred. Thank you. Kiss your daughter for me. Will do. <laughs>